عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين The topic we have in this brief 20 minutes is about dealing with doubts How do we deal with doubts? And if you are someone who thinks to themselves I've never had a doubt about Islam before Don't worry your child or your brother or your sibling or a fellow musalli at the masjid or somebody you know might come across one of these questions in their life. So it's important to pay attention. And uh, we'll come across the idea that all of us come up with questions about our deen. Nobody is free from this challenge, from this problem that we are about to address. We have 20 minutes. We're going to split it into two. Since the British like football, first half we'll be looking at the sources of doubt. And the second half will be looking at the solutions. How do you deal with doubt? First, let us ask the question. If a Muslim has a doubt, has a question about their faith, has a challenge, is confused about something to do with their religion, is that something wrong? Are they sinful for this? The Prophet ﷺ was asked by a companion of his, Ya Rasul Allah, O Messenger of Allah, thoughts come to our mind that we would rather jump off from a cliff than say aloud. And the Prophet ﷺ says, you are not accountable for the thoughts that come to your mind. You're only accountable for your speech or your actions. And so all of us, we all get thoughts, we all get whispers, we all get questions, we all get concerns. But as the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّمَا شِفَاءُ الْعَيْءِ السؤال. The solution is to ask to be brave and to question. When you look at where does doubt come from, the first source of doubt is external, outside. So you have a believer, a Muslim, they are sure, 100% sure about their Islam, but then they go into the university classroom, or they read a book, or they see a suggested video on YouTube, or somebody sends them a message on WhatsApp, and suddenly it starts making them wonder. It starts making them question. And one of the examples of this, one of the little known examples of this in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is that Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, one of the Prophet's companions who migrated to Ethiopia, to Al-Habasha. After migrating to Ethiopia, due to the Christian environment that he was in, he eventually converted to Christianity, according to Ibn Ishaq. And his wife eventually marries the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Umm Habiba. So this is a companion of the Prophet who moves to another land, a land where he Muslims are in the minority and the Christians are in the majority, and he converts to Christianity. And Ibn Ishaq reports that he would cross the Muslims praying and he would make fun of them. If this is possible for a companion of the Prophet wasallam, it is possible for any one of us to be affected by the environment outside of us. We are like plants. If the sun is coming in that direction, we will grow in that direction. And so this is the first thing, environment. And so whether it's for yourself or those around you, the first thing to note is cut off the sources of doubts. Imagine a house in the middle of a sandstorm, or let's be more clear, in the middle of a snowstorm. And the windows of the house are open and the house is full, full of snow. And I tell you, take a spade and start removing the snow. That's not the wisest thing to do. The smartest thing to do is first close the windows. Don't let any of the snow come in. So the first thing before talking how to deal with doubt, we should talk how to stop doubt coming in the first place, how to prevent it. And the first of these is don't expose yourself to doubts. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah in Miftah Dar al-Sa'ada, he says, one day I was sitting with my teacher, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah. فَكُنْتُ أُرِيدُهُ إِرَادًا بَعْدَ إراد. I was asking him question after question, doubt after doubt. Until Ibn Taymiyyah said to his student, let me give you some advice. لَا تَجْعَلْ قَلْبَكَ كَالْإِسْفِنْجَ Don't make your heart like a sponge for doubts. Don't expose it to doubts. Don't force yourself to think of questions. Keep it simple, keep it natural. And so I'm going to say something which... It might be something relevant for many of us. Many of us, particularly on YouTube, particularly the younger ones from, from us, many of us like to watch speakers' corner debates, or we like to watch debates about Islam. And we think that watching these debates will increase our Iman. 
what happens and i'm talking as somebody who has experienced this i have talk i have spoken to at least a hundred young muslims who have doubted or were ready to leave islam i'm not talking theoretical i'm talking from experience what happens when the muslim debater that you like is not able to respond to a question from his christian or his sikh or his atheist debater what happens when the other person debating is more convincing why would you expose yourself to these questions why would you expose your iman to this it's like buying a very old 15 year old car and then taking it on the m6 straight away why would you do that you know you're going to end up in the garage very soon you know unless you have a very strong and robust iman so this is a very important thing when you come across videos clips books don't expose yourself to something you are not ready for لا تجعل قلبك كالإسفنجة. Another example from the Quran of believers being affected by the environment around them is when Banu Israel came across a group of people. This is after they left Egypt and after Allah showed them miracles and after they saw the staff split the sea. They cross into the desert and they see a group of people worshipping idols. So what do they say to Musa alayhi salam? قالوا يا موسى اجعل لنا إلها كما لهم آلهة موسى why don't you make us idols like they have idols these are the people who just saw the sea split it doesn't get more miraculous than that but because of the environment because they saw somebody else do it it makes them doubt it makes them question Am I missing out on something? Am I worshipping in the correct way? Would this idol not bring me closer to Allah? So watch your company. Watch what you see. Look at what you read on your news feed. Look at what you watch on YouTube. All of this is going to either create doubts or is going to protect you from doubts. And if you are a parent, be careful of what your children are exposed to. And believe me, if they are in school, if they are in university, they are going to be exposed. So that comes to the second part. We're going to come to how to deal with that later. The second source of doubt. So we said the first is external. It's outside. People worshipping idols. People not believing in God. People X, Y, doing X, Y, Z. It makes you wonder. This is the first. The second source is internal. Inside yourself. I'll give you an example. I know a brother. A very practicing brother. Who had memorized the entire Quran. He wanted to marry someone, but it didn't work out. You know, he was Bengali, she was Somali. The parents never let these things happen in many cases. In his depression over not being able to marry this girl, he stopped praying salah. And in the guilt and the pain of not praying salah, he started having questions. Now, where is all of this coming from? This is a brother who memorized the Quran, who was the president of an Islamic society, five times salah and much. Where are the doubts coming from? Did he see people worshipping idols? Did he read a book online? No, it's coming from inside. From his depression, from his anger, from his pain, from his suffering. And with such people, when the, when the doubt, when the questions are coming from inside, it's not about answering the question. If he comes to me and he asks me one question, I answer the question. Tomorrow he will have another question and another question and another question. Because what's bothering him is not the questions. Deep down he is wondering, why did Allah do this to me? And until we can solve that question, all of the other questions will not go away. His pain is emotional. It's not intellectual. It's not logical. His pain is emotional, so he's questioning Allah. And so when somebody is in such emotional pain, you have to address the emotional pain. You have to address the psychological pain before you answer their question. Now let's come to the solutions. Some people have doubts because of stuff going on inside them. Some people have doubts because stuff they see outside. And believe me, every one of us here, children or adults, you're going to see stuff outside and inside that's going to make you question. Now what do you do? The first thing is, never feel afraid to ask a question. Ibrahim alayhi salam, does he not ask Allah? Rabbi arini kayfa tuhil mawta. Oh Allah, show me how you return the dead to life. Now this is a prophet of Allah. Does he need to see this evidence? So Allah asks him, Qala awala tu'min. Don't you believe, O oh Ibrahim? Ibrahim alayhi salam says, yes, of course. 
قال بلى ولكن ليطمئن قلبي I believe of course but I want to feel more reassured in my belief I want to increase in my belief because seeing is not the same as believing and so this is the first thing don't be afraid to ask a question however embarrassing the question is if you are living in Manchester this is the man to ask your questions you have people in this masjid who are ready to answer your questions don't be shy the Sahaba would ask the Prophet وسلم, such embarrassing questions, you and me would rather dig a hole for ourselves rather than ask these questions. When they asked the Prophet وسلم, Unsub lana rabbak. what is the family tree of Allah? Allah reveals, Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah the one. When they asked the Prophet وسلم, Ij'al lana that anwat, kama lahum that anwat. Let us why don't we worship Allah via this tree? Or via these idols, like those people are. The Prophet ﷺ gets upset with them. They ask him embarrassing questions. But the Prophet ﷺ always is there with an answer. So the first thing is, if you have a question about your religion, never be afraid to ask the question. But number two, this is the most important point. The best way to deal with doubts is to prevent them all together by having a strong foundation. A strong foundation in the basics. You and your children and your friends and everybody in this masjid, you should be able to answer the question, why am I a Muslim? Why do I believe in Allah? Why do I believe in messengers? Why do I believe in the Quran? This has to be a strong foundation. Allah says in the Quran, ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَلِمَةً طَيِّبَةً كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ Allah gives the example, of the word Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, he says it's like a tree. How is it like a tree? Asluha thabit, its roots are firmly held in the ground. Wa faruha fi sama, and its branches are in the sky. Now tell me, if there is a tree which roots are firmly in the ground, if a wind blows, will it fly away? It can't. Its roots are strong. The doubts are like wind. They'll blow you this way and they'll push you that way. But if your foundations, your basics are strong, you know why you are a believer and why you are a Muslim and you understand why you believe in Allah, nothing can blow you away. A good example of this, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. When a group of disbelievers came to him and they said to him, don't you hear your friend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? He tells us that he has just taken a flight to the sky and to... Masjid al-Aqsa and he came back in one night. Do you really believe this? Now at this time, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq had not heard it from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He's hearing it from his enemies. Now this can shake him. And there are some narrations that are disputed whether they are authentic or not. Most scholars say they are not authentic. But I'll mention it anyways. Some narrations mention that some Sahaba left Islam after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj when he went on his journey to Al-Aqsa and the heavens and back. Some people could not believe it according to some narrations which I don't believe is authentic according to the majority of scholars. But what did Abu Bakr As-Siddiq say when they asked him this question? Do you really believe your friend Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did all of this in one night? He says, لَإِنْ قَالَهُ فَقَدْ صدق. If he said it, it's true. Because so many evidences are there that this man is a prophet of Allah. He's not a, not a random person. So many proofs are there. Whatever he says is true. See, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he goes back to the foundations. He knows for sure that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is an honest man. Whatever he speaks now is true. And then he says, Usaddiquhu fi khabari sama. I believe that an angel comes to him from the sky and gives him revelation. How can I not believe? He went on a journey at night. I believe in things that are even beyond this. So how can I not believe in this? So, to build a strong foundation. And this is a message for the imams and the teachers and the mashayikh as well. Is that today when we teach aqidah, when we teach Muslim belief, we should not teach it like it was taught seven centuries ago. Our children do not need to know about khawarij and murji'a and asha'ira, etc. They need to know about atheism and evolution and feminism and the questions of today. These are the belief challenges of today. We need to address them today. So build a foundation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has filled the Quran with logical proofs for his existence, 
for his creativeness, for his deservedness to be worshipped, for the Prophet ﷺ being a messenger, for the Qur'an being only from Allah. Allah has filled the Qur'an with these messages to think, to reflect on these proofs. So even just reciting the Qur'an with its translation and thinking about these proofs Allah gives you, this is enough to give you a strong foundation. Then next, what happens when you're asked a question? There's a very important technique you should remember. In Arabic, we call it Raddul Mutashabihi ila al-Muhkam. When you come across something doubtful, go back to what you are certain about. I'll give you an example. Recently, and this happens every few years or every so often, a non-Muslim passes away. And this non-Muslim is a very nice person, a very quote-unquote good person. Stephen Hawking, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, you can think of the names. And when a non-Muslim passes away, many Muslims ask the question, this person gave so much charity, this person was such a nice guy, what will Allah do with this person? Yeah, this is the question. Now, there is an answer to this question, but let's assume you don't know the answer to this question. What do you know for sure about Allah and how he deals with human beings on the Day of Judgment? What do you know 100% for sure? You may not know how Allah is going to deal with Nelson Mandela, but you know something about Allah. What do you know about him? Sorry? He is the just. Allahu huwa al-adl. Even a child can tell you this, right? Basic. It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. Allahu huwa al-adl. Allah is, the, is fair and just. So you can answer the question, look, my friend, I don't know what Allah is going to do with Mother Teresa, but I know he is the most just, and whatever he does, it is just. Simple answer. You don't always need to know the answer, the detailed answer to every question. Go back to the basics, what do you know for sure about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Of course, there's a detailed answer. How does Allah deal with people who never heard the revelation, who never heard the message of Islam? How does he test them? But all of it can come under this point. Allah is fair and just. Why would Allah be unjust? What does he have to get out of it? Does he get any brownie points out of it? Well, billah. And like this, there are so many doubts. You might hear something at university, something at school. Somebody on the street might ask you, you Muslims are like this. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam spread Islam by the sword. This, this, this. Go back to the basics. Does Islam allow you? I remember, I'll tell you a funny story. Once I was on a flight and somebody asked me the question, somebody sitting next to me, we got talking and they found out that I was a Muslim chaplain. So they said, okay, yes, I heard that you Muslims want to kill the infidels. You, you want Muslims, you, you like to kill the kuffar. So I asked them, are you an infidel? He said, yes. I said, then if I was supposed to kill you, why are you still breathing? You will not find a Muslim who, is like, who thinks like that. This is enough. Did the Prophet ﷺ go willy-nilly killing the Jews and Christians who lived around him? No, he didn't. He made deals with them. He coexisted with them. He made a contract, an agreement with them. You respect boundaries, we respect boundaries. When he opened Fath Mecca, when he went back to Mecca, the people who killed him and his family and attacked them, he said, Idhabu fantumu tulaqa, you are all free. The examples are many, but the point is, you can go back to the basics. You don't need to know the answer to every question. And this comes as a good example in the life of the Prophet ﷺ when he explains to his companion how to answer the question, who created Allah? The first thing is nobody asked him the question. He introduced the question. This is very important. If you're a parent, before your child asks you a question, you should introduce the question to them. So you can teach them how to answer it. If you're an imam, a teacher, a friend, uh, you have a new Muslim that you know, you introduce the question and you answer it in a smart way so they know. Don't wait for them to ask. This is the first thing. The Prophet ﷺ says, لا يزال الناس يسألون. People will keep asking questions. حتى يسألوا خلق الله الأرض فمن خلق الله Until they ask, Allah created everything, so who created Allah? Now, there is an answer to this question. But it depends what do you need. Do you need an intellectual answer? You need a full philosophical, logical answer? I'll, we can give that to you. But the vast majority of people, these doubts, they are just like flies. They are whispers. They come to their mind. And it is enough for them to go back to the basics. So the Prophet ﷺ says, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Reassure yourself. No, no, no. I believe in Allah and His Messenger. 
I know with certainty based on proofs that Allah exists and his messenger وسلم, is his prophet and you throw away this whisper. That's one way to deal with it. Go back to the basics that you know. The second way to deal with it is sometimes you need to find the detailed answer if you are not satisfied. And you should ask a specialist. You should ask an imam. If the imam doesn't know, he will point you to someone who can answer your question. But the most important thing is if you ever come across a doubt, a question about your religion, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you don't have an answer, believe me, that question has been asked and the answer has been given. So remind yourself why you believe and be patient until you find the answer. I'll end on an important note. A lot of doubts come from spiritual reasons. When I said inside, sometimes they come from spiritual reasons. And one of the reasons for doubts can be sins. And the more one sins, the more one's heart becomes dark, as the Prophet ﷺ informed us, نُكِتَتْ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهِ نُكْتَةً سَوْدَىٰ And this can also lead to doubts. So many of us, we have to think about as well, that one of the ways to dispel doubts is to do istighfar, is to ask Allah to forgive our sins. And so to summarize, we said doubts can come from internal reasons or sources or from external sources. We said the best way to deal with doubts is to create a strong foundation for why you believe in Islam. And then if you come across a doubt, there are two ways to deal with it. One way is you go back to the basics that you know for sure. And the second way is you look for a detailed answer for your question. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Jazakumullahu khayran, wal'afu minkum, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyana Muhammadin 